Picture yourself delving into the maps of three historical giants, the Soviet Union, China, and India. After some time of careful study, you notice that these colossal nations, each with their own indelible mark on world history, somehow converge at a singular, almost hidden point, nestled delicately at their edges. Amidst the imposing Pamir Mountains lies the intriguing land of Tajikistan, a Central Asian gem that emerged from the shadows of the Soviet Union in 1991. Tajikistan is a country shaped by its resilient leader since the end of its civil war in 1997. It's a nation imprinted with marks of Soviet imperialism and is enriched by its geographical location along the historic Silk Road. What are the untold historical tales of this nation? How did it find itself in a web of economic dependency with Russia? And with the unfolding events in Ukraine, how is the dynamic beginning to shift for this little known country? Let's roll. The Pamir Mountains, often referred to as the roof of the world, dominate Tajikistan's landscape. The mountains have acted as both a barrier and a bridge, isolating communities and creating unique cultural pockets while offering passage to traders, explorers and conquerors. Ismail Somoni Peak stands at an impressive 7,495 meters, formerly known as Stalin Peak and then Communist Peak during the Soviet era. For context, Mount Everest is 8,848 meters tall, and there are several peaks above 7,000 meters in the Pamirs. Tajikistan also shares the Fergana Valley, one of Central Asia's most fertile and densely populated regions, with neighboring Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. The valley has been a historical crossroads, where Persian, Turkic, and Mongol empires have intersected, each leaving its unique imprint on the region. The first significant turning point was its conquest by the Persian Empire. The Tajiks underwent a process of Persianization, adopting Persian language and customs. This influence is still noticeable today, with Tajik being the only official language in Central Asia written in the Persian alphabet. Following the collapse of the Persian Empire, Tajikistan fell under the sway of the Greeks. After Alexander the Great's conquest, this period brought Hellenistic influences, particularly in art and architecture. After the Greeks, the Kushan Empire combined elements of Greek, Persian, and Indian cultures. This era is noted for its cultural and religious diversity with Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and other faiths coexisting. The Haptolites, often identified with the White Huns, were the next to rule. They were a confederation of nomadic tribes. The Arab conquest brought Islam to the region in the 8th century. The majority of Tajiks converted to Sunni Islam, which remains the predominant religion in Tajikistan today. The Khwarezmians, a dynasty of Turkic Mamluk origin, took over from the Arabs, but their rule was relatively short-lived, collapsing under the onslaught of the Mongols. The Mongol rule, initiated by Genghis Khan, was characterized by significant destruction, but also the unification of vast territories triggering demographic changes and introducing new political and administrative systems. Following the Mongols, the Turco-Mongol conqueror Tamerlane founded the Timurid Empire. The empire was culturally hybrid, combining Turco-Mongolian and Persianate influences. By the 19th century, Tajikistan had become split between the Russian Empire and the Qing dynasty, as the Russians took over the western valleys, while the Qing took over the eastern mountains. Russian rule over Central Asia was marked by settler colonialism and a pivot towards cotton production over traditional agriculture, as railways allowed for the easy transport of people and industrialization led to increased demand for cotton in garment factories. However, owing to its location on the frontier and the lack of interest from the imperial government, Tajikistan would remain largely neglected as more major cities like Samarkand in modern-day Uzbekistan were connected to the Russian railway network. This lack of interest by the Russian imperial government resulted in Tajikistan preserving much of its traditional lifestyle and culture, even as the areas around it were rapidly modernizing. It also meant that the effects of Russian settler colonialism, characterized by the influx of Russian settlers and the displacement and marginalization of the native population, were less pronounced in Tajikistan than in other parts of Central Asia. The collapse of the Russian Empire following the February and December revolutions of 1917 left a power vacuum in its peripheral territories, including Tajikistan. 
This led to local leaders and tribal chieftains assuming control, effectively liberating the region from Russian authority and providing a temporary sense of self-governance. The geographical remoteness of Tajikistan coupled with its rugged mountainous landscape acted as a natural barrier against foreign invasion. This allowed the region a degree of isolation and the ability to maintain its traditional lifestyle and culture, relatively untouched by the chaos of the Russian Civil War. However, this was not to last. The Bolsheviks having seized power in Russia were determined to re-establish control over the former imperial territories. Their focus eventually turned towards Central Asia. With the fall of the Emirate of Bukhara, Tajikistan's de facto independence came to an end. The region was progressively integrated into the Soviet state. And in 1929, Tajikistan was given the same status as the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic, making it fully independent within the Soviet Union. It was also in this year that the current boundaries of Tajikistan were established under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. Soviet rule would, in addition to changing of borders, mean the collectivization of agriculture and suppression of the local religions in favor of state atheism, which in Tajikistan meant the suppression of Islam. The Soviet Union would invest more into Tajikistan than the prior imperial Russian government, of which the most important one was the Central Asian Energy Network. It worked such that during the summer, dams in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan would provide power downstream, while in exchange, Uzbekistan would provide coal during winter for warming. In Tajikistan, this led to the construction of dams on the Amu Darya River. Furthermore, Tajikistan's agriculture would see a shift towards cotton production as part of the Soviet plan for Central Asia, which in the end resulted in the drying of the Aral Sea. As the Soviet Union entered its final decades of existence, it would also mean increased instability within Central Asia. As the Soviet economy began to collapse, ethnic tensions between Tajiks and Kyrgyz in the Fergana Valley would require intervention by Soviet forces in 1975 and 1989. By 1991, following the failed coup in Moscow and the declaration of independence by other Soviet republics, the Tajik SSR would also declare independence on September 9, 1991. The transition from Soviet rule to independent governance was far from smooth. In 1992, the nation plunged into a civil war triggered by a struggle for power between proponents of democracy, Islam, and the residual Soviet-era administration. As the war escalated, the capital city of Dushanbe fell into crisis, while the eastern region of gorno badakhshan seized the opportunity to declare independence from Tajikistan. Meanwhile, the remnants of the Soviet-era government retreated to the south of the country. The bloody civil war came to an end in 1997 with an armistice agreement. The government succeeded in regaining control over the country. In an effort to restore peace and stability, it had to make significant concessions to the opposition forces, including representation in the government. This agreement marked the end of a destructive period in Tajikistan's history and the beginning of a new recovery and rebuilding. During the Tajik civil war, Emomali Rahmon would come to be elected as the head of the government. By the end of the civil war, Rahman had become the undisputed ruler of the Tajik state, having crushed any political opposition. Rahman has gone on to reconstruct the war-torn country while keeping himself in power. He also secured the Tajik Aluminium Company, also known as Talco, under his control. The control of the aluminium plant was vital since following the civil war, it was the only productive industrial asset in the entire country, providing the government with a vital source of income. Tajikistan would also allow Russia to maintain the presence of the Russian 201st Motor Rifle Division near the Tajik capital, which continues to be based there to support Rahman's regime should an uprising occur. Meanwhile, the Tajik military was also organized with internal security as its primary concern. The outer regions of the country have smaller forces with less capable equipment, while the northern region's forces will be reinforced with better equipment only in the case of conflict in the Fergana Valley. The capital region has the largest number of forces with Tajikistan's best weapons and equipment, together with paratroopers and an engineer corp. The logic behind this is so that if any of the forces in the outer regions were to rebel, the more capable and loyal forces of the capital would be able to deny the rebelling forces access, while the engineers would be able to block off the only roads connecting the capital with the Fergana Valley and Gorno-Badakhshan regions, which rebelled against the government during the civil war. 
Additionally, should the forces in the capital rebel against the government, the Russian 201st unit would by itself be able to fight all the Tajik forces near the capital owing to its supposed superior quality. There is a clear lack of trust towards the ranks of the Tajik troops, and for this reason the total number of permanent military personnel is not more than 10,000 troops. Clearly the main priority of all these plans is just to maintain control within the country, rather than protect it from any outside threats. While Tajikistan's economy has improved since the civil war, it hasn't developed much either. Its economy grew from $921.6 million in 1997 to $8.7 billion in 2021. As such, the country remains poor, with its GDP per capita sitting at $897 in 2021. Its current economy is actually on par or slightly below the levels it was at before the breakup of the Soviet Union. As such, it is the only country in the world which hasn't seen any economic growth from leaving the USSR. And as you can see here, its economy was totally obliterated following the collapse and the ensuing civil war. The country remains largely agricultural, with cotton production making up 15% of its economy. While the mining sector has grown to account for 50%, with aluminium, gold and iron being the primary exports. Additionally, water and electricity exports make up a notable part of the legal Tajik economy, while drug smuggling from Afghanistan is Tajikistan's largest illegal industry. Corruption in Tajikistan is a prevalent issue that extends to nearly all sectors of the economy, posing a significant barrier for business planning to operate or invest in the country. It is widely acknowledged that becoming a traffic policeman in Tajikistan often involves paying a bribe, in fact, the price of securing a position within the traffic police is usually substantial, often running into thousands of dollars. This is a major barrier for many potential candidates, and it perpetuates inequality within the force by favoring those who are able to pay such sums. Once in position, it is not uncommon for traffic policemen to recoup their investment by soliciting bribes from motorists. This is usually done under the guise of imposing fines for supposed violations or traffic rules. Such practices not only harm the image of the traffic police, but also contribute to a culture of corruption and impunity. Tajikistan's score on the Corruption Perceptions Index is E, the worst grade possible. It actually sits below Afghanistan. The country's corruption issue not only hampers economic growth, but also impedes the improvement of public services and the overall development of the nation. As such, its population has few chances of gaining good career opportunities within the country. This leads to one peculiar fact noted by the World Bank. Tajikistan is the most remittance-dependent country in the world. Remittances from Russia make up between a third or even as much as half of Tajikistan's economy. And as such, a huge percentage of the working male population of Tajikistan lives in Russia, either legally or not, usually filling the least attractive jobs. The significance of these remittances is very visible in the small Dushanbe airport, where on any given day around two in three flights are into Russian cities. With the Tajik economy so reliant on remittances from Russia, combined with the presence of the Russian 201st Motor Rifle Division near the capital, this gives Russia immense leverage. If Russia were to suddenly expel all the Tajiks within its borders, it would create a humanitarian disaster. The five republics of Central Asia, including Tajikistan, find themselves in a challenging situation as Russia's invasion of Ukraine is making it difficult to balance allegiances to Russia with international relations. And Tajikistan, being the poorest Central Asian country and the most reliant on the Russian economy, is also highly vulnerable to these effects of Western sanctions. However, just as Russia's economy has proven itself to be quite resilient in the face of economic sanctions, Tajikistan hasn't exactly suffered any major setbacks either. Most surprisingly, Russian remittances have grown. Originally, the World Bank predicted a 22% decline for 2022. But due to increased demand for labor and to the Russian ruble's appreciation against the US dollar, one of the main pillars of Tajikistan's economy has remained stable. Whether or not this continues is unclear and will depend largely on how the Russian economy continues to perform. 
It's no surprise then that despite the war and the accompanying sanctions, Tajikistan's economic interactions with Russia have been on an upwards trajectory. Trade turnover between Tajikistan and Russia has witnessed a growth of over 22% in the first eight months of 2022, which is largely attributable to new trade patterns prompted by sanctions. Russia's trade turnover with other nations such as Kazakhstan has also been on the rise. This implies a broader trend of Russia deepening economic ties with nations in its geopolitical vicinity. As Russia searches for new avenues of doing business and gaining much-needed goods. While the devaluation of the ruble has led to increased costs for imports from Russia, the weak ruble can also make Tajik goods more competitive in the Russian marketplace. What has however taken a hit is Russia's reputation and soft power. Surveys indicate that a majority of people in Tajikistan blame the current economic problems on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This sentiment is further fueled by a decline in the popularity of the Russian language and the blocking of Central Asian media outlets in Russia, especially the ones that attempt to cover the Ukraine war with any objectivity. Tajikistan is gradually changing. The younger generation, who do not remember Soviet times, are less likely to speak Russian and no longer consider Russia an example to aspire to. This shift in public opinion and the changing political landscape could potentially lead to a progressive distancing of Tajikistan from Russia. Furthermore, the recent takeover by the Taliban in Afghanistan has raised concerns about violent extremism and organized crime spilling over. All this means that the presence of Russian troops in Tajikistan is more necessary than ever as they provide a strategic balance of power. Their withdrawal to Ukraine could expose Tajikistan to various destabilizing security threats. Economically, it has also resulted in lost revenues, as the Russian military presence contributes to the local economy. Business owners in Dushanbe and Bokhtar have noticed a significant drop in the number of Russian soldiers who once frequented their venues or ordered services. Officially, however, this redeployment is said to be related to the worsening situation on the Afghan border, not Ukraine. In light of the uncertain future of Russia and the resulting instability it may bring, Tajikistan must pursue a path of political and economic reform to alleviate social tension and build trust in its government. While President Rahman has established a political system in Tajikistan that has maintained political stability and his rule, this system has come at the expense of the common people, who have a hard time of prospering in their home country. Furthermore, the system's reliance on Rahman's leadership raises concerns about its sustainability after his eventual passing, as there is no guarantee that the elites will remain loyal to his successor. The presence of Russian soldiers near Dushanbe is not guaranteed, especially in the event of a catastrophic failure in Ukraine. A reduction in Russian remittances, either due to fluctuations in the exchange rate or an economic collapse of Russia, could have devastating effects on the Tajik economy. This situation raises the specter of a potential destabilization of Tajikistan, reminiscent of the civil war that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1992. To mitigate these risks, Tajikistan should focus on enhancing economic integration with its neighboring Central Asian states leveraging historical and cultural ties for geopolitical advantages. The United States and the European Union should offer increased economic partnership and investment opportunities. However, any assistance or investment should be contingent on visible progress in political and economic reforms. In the broader context of Central Asia, there are temporary advantages to supporting Russia in its time of need. However, Russia's credibility has been tarnished due to its failures in Ukraine. While it is unlikely that Central Asian countries will completely pivot away from Russia, its influence in the region is diminishing. Next, why not watch my video about the heart of Central Asia, the Fergana Valley. And this is my Patreon map. Everyone on this map is a legend. Thank you all for your support. It's your perspective out.